Hello and welcome to today's webinar, where today, of course, we're talking about HMOs and we're talking about the high street. The high street obviously has had a huge change over the course of the last kind of two years, massive kind of uplift, massive kind of change in terms of, of what um, opportunity sits there. Some huge planning changes going along alongside all of that. And of course, all of that sweats out into a huge amount of opportunity. So, so today I'm delighted to welcome uh, my guest, Stuart Scott. Hey, Stuart, how are you going? Oh, okay. Very good. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, Stuart, so Stuart's going to be helping me sort of try and answer this question today around kind of the high street and what's the future of it and how we're going to find opportunities and, and kind of how my HMO sit alongside all of that. So Stuart has a, has a background in kind of product at the, at the sort of very early stages of, of his career, really kind of mapping pains to, to opportunity and really kind of uncovering all that. But now he's a property investor, property developer, and of course, a mentor and coach as well. Um, at a company called Co-Living Spaces. So I suppose, Stuart, just kind of before we, before we begin, perhaps we could ask a, a bit of a searching question for you. you know, kind of why, why move from product into, into property? And, and I suppose why in particular, why sort of, why coaching? Uh, well, the move, the move into, into um, Co-Living HMOs and I guess into property, because obviously I, I work with a number of uh, investors and developers and landlords and aspiring landlords at the moment. And, um, I, you know, my background is very similar to, to a lot of other people, which is I dabbled with buy-to-let. I think, you know, many of us did. We dabbled with buy-to-lets. We did our own houses. We dabbled with the buy-to-lets. We realized it would take a long time to replace our income with them. It wasn't necessarily that I, I hated my job or I wanted to get out of my job. It's just that I could see that I needed to have assets, capital appreciation for, for wealth, and also uh, an additional revenue stream. So it was all basically around giving myself options of how I want to spend my time. Everyone has a different kind of avenue for what they want to do. Some people enjoy their job, but they want to have the freedom. Maybe a partner wants to spend less time going to work. So for me, it was about, I've been full-time in property for about eight years. So for me, it was about a different revenue stream and cho choice of how I spend my time. Awesome, awesome. Uh, the, training, the training side of things was um, <clears throat> a natural progression of that I didn't I didn't get I'm primarily a developer I'm primarily a developer and who spends say 75 percent of my time on development and just 25 percent of my time on training right so let's jump into it let's start talking about the high street let's start talking about opportunities let's start talking HMOs and sort of see see where the world takes us shall we brilliant shall I um shall I share my screen yeah please do yeah what I'll do is if, um, if you, you can, there's probably some bits on the on the first bit around the classes, I think it's good to dive in as well. So we'll keep this nice and interactive for everybody. Yeah, sure. Um, can you just confirm you see my screen full yeah, yeah, screen? Yeah, beautiful. Absolutely. Apologies if I'm a bit croaky in, in advance. I've, uh, I've come out of the back of COVID and I still have this sore throat three weeks later. And it, oh, good Lord. I know exactly. You imagine it'd be like two, three days, but three weeks later. Three weeks <laughs> anyway, so. As Paul mentioned, we're talking about the high streets uh, today, uh, primarily commercial conversions. And we've got a real treat for you because there's a whole lot of fresh content that I've created. And there's, in fact, a case study, which this is the first place the case study has been shared. So it hasn't been shared anywhere on social media. It's exclusive for this, this, um, for this uh, webinar. So <laughs> most of what we're talking about today is the changing high street. As Paul mentioned, you know, there's a lot of changes in the high street. Um, I've been doing uh, mixed use and commercial conversions for a while. And also, Paul has an extensive background in mixed use and commercial conversions as well. So you know, there's a lot of stuff here we can kind of, kind of uh, uh, share with people along the way. So primarily, let's, let's dive into some of the changes that we've seen on the high street with regards to the planning side of things. So, and Paul, you, you'll probably jump into this, this first one as well, because yeah. Class E is an interesting um, area, area where we've created basically for the commercial sector, if you like, and retail customers we've created a flexible use class which means they no longer need to put in planning application to jump from i don't know say a financial institution or over to for example a shop or from a shop to something else um so it's, it makes it more convenient and flexible and streamlines effectively all the a wide variety of commercial uses for potential tenants who may decide to move into your commercial units paul is there anything you want to add into class e at all I mean, I could talk about Class E for all afternoon if I'm not careful. So I, th I think for me, Class E, Class E is very interesting in terms of what you can now do, certainly on the high street, what you can do with kind of back parts of shops, upper parts of shops, all that kind of stuff. But I suppose the PD rights become particularly interesting. I think there's kind of, there's some stuff that historically you wouldn't have been able to do um, with uses within Class E, thinking kind of 
you know, dentists and doctor surgeons, this kind of stuff and protect the amenities in reality that now have lots of space to move to and this sort of stuff. So I think there's lots of opportunity in class E, um, really exciting, but I think that's probably what I'll say for now, because it's probably yeah, some exactly. other so we'll stuff to come next. So we'll go into those those additional classes that Paul's kind of te teasing our intro into there. <laughs> um, yeah, class, class E has the opportunities for conversion out of them, but, but for the tenant, for the commercial tenant, it offers flexibility. So if we are going to retain commercial units and rent them out, this gives us more flexibility and the tenants more flexibility. So um, it's an interesting, it's an interesting way they converted it and there's a lot of opportunity there. So most of you know, there's a lot of, lot of shops on the high street, a lot of retail units, you know, I, primarily we're, we're assuming that you've converted the building here. So what you've got left is basically we reduce the commercial down, or this is certainly what we do with our developments. We reduce the commercial element down, increase the residential element. And then what we're left with is really flexible class E that can be more affordable for the tenants that's left along the front edge of the high street. But we'll go into that in a bit more detail. So then that leads us on to class G. So class, class G, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Paul, class G has been around for some time. It has a long time, but it's now affectionately called super class G, I think. So, um... or, uh, or, or, or as some people like to call it, super G. <laughs> yes, yeah, quite, quite super G. <laughs> um, but yeah, but primarily uh, for those of the tech, you know listeners who are new to uh, Class G, basically, if you take for example this this building in the high street here, under Class G, you can automatically, assuming you meet the criteria, because it's all about the criteria, assuming you meet the criteria, you can turn, you can create up to two apartments, residential apartments, above the commercial. So it's for the upper specifically so uh what that would mean for example is you could do you could we won't actually let's not get into hmos at the moment because we're going to come on to that in a second but primarily you could grab two residential units above the commercial under class class g and the beauty of, of that is that it applies so back in the days it used to just apply to shops on the ground floor whereas now of course class e it now applies to all buildings in class e use so so you could have um in a more secondary location, perhaps an office building um, that sits with shops either side of it. In effect, you know, think solicitors, think um, estate agents, kind of. But that's that sort of kind of um, stage for A two use rather than. And, but in effect, kind of that that sort of um, that commercial use, you can now take the upper parts of that and put two flats in under Class G because that Class G now is extended to all of Class E rather than just what was shops historically. Yeah, that's a good point. Actually, the the definition of what you could have converted above is now much wider, so that's even more uh, opportunity. Obviously, um, we'll mention that about the uh, Nimbus as well and how that can search for those kind of sites. So then that leads us on quite nicely from G to Class L. Now, Class L is where you can convert a C three residential, so standard residential apartment, house, or anything across into C four HMO. Now, where does this become really useful? Let's go back to the original one we just looked at. Let's say you've got your uh, conversion to residential that you've utilized, two apartments above. Then you go from the G, sorry, from the G to the L, which would mean that you could then get two uh, co-living HMOs above Class E, a wider range of commercial uses. So that means, and we'll get to why this is important as a, as a, as a tool, in combination with class MA, which has some restrictions. So we kind of have, need to kind of like play them, understand how they all fit together. So class G gives you two units above, and then class L will allow you to turn those two units or one unit, whatever you've converted into, uh, into a HMO above there. Okay. Further bit of complication to this, I'm conscious that dwelling a lot on the, the PD rights at the start, but if you consider the Bon Marche shop just to the left of the one you've highlighted, if you were to split that retail unit into two, you could then apply it twice. Yes. So it would be possible to get four flats above Bon Marche, Bon Marche or whatever it's called, yeah. because you've got two individual buildings, two retail units, you can get two flats above each of the retail units. And then from that, so in fact, you've got four flats, you can then apply Class L to get six um, HMO rooms in each of those flats in effect. So you could take... You could probably put 24 units, 24 HMO letting units in the above the Bon Marche. Um, yeah, well, that's well, split. Well, I think, and, and the key to that, Paul, is wide commercial. What you spotted straight away was the Bon Marche was actually effectively a double width, and you could put two doors in there, split that through the middle, 
and that you could get perfectly two retail oh, yeah. out of it. Obviously, if it was kilt, if it was Kerner Jewelers, you wouldn't be able to because <laughs> it's a thin thin building. But you're right, Bon Marsh, for example, double it's almost like a double breasted building if you like two sides to it. You could split that. So very yeah. Um, then that leads us on very nicely to Class M A. So this is where we've been able to convert from commercial to residential. So I'll just kind of keep the pace through this so we can get into some of the core content and the case studies for you. So class MA, kind of in a nutshell, I've done you some diagrams. So where we use class MA, a few different ways you could use it. I'm just going to talk through some of the ways that we use it. So firstly, use class MA on the ground floor. So this is the ground floor of the commercial. Now, this diagram I'm showing you here is assuming you're in the primary high street area. Obviously, you'll need to speak to your planning consultant. What is the primary high street area? That's why, because in those areas, you'll need to retain the commercial at the frontage. So the commercial is the frontage to the, to the high street, if you like. Now, this is assuming that you need to retain that because it's in the primary high street area. So under class MA, you can convert the rear of the building into apartments, single lets. Now, they do need to meet minimum space standards. So you can't go below. It's not like previous <laughs> previous ones where you didn't have to. You do need to do it. And you do need to do natural, natural light. And you do need to do windows. So all those basic things need to apply. Now, of course, if you're not in the primary high street, you can, you, you can potentially convert all the way to the frontage as well, which is what I've done in a few occasions where I've not been in the primary high street. So class MA can be used on the ground floor. Now, equally, class MA, unlike the previous class M, so part M, can be used across the whole building. It's more flexible. Now, in this instance, we're seeing in this diagram, it's assuming you're in the primary high street area. So you need to retain, for example, the commercial on the ground floor at the front. If you weren't in the primary th thoroughfare or primary high street area, you potentially would be able to convert all of it. But again, they would all need to meet minimum space standards of one beds, two beds, studios, whatever they are. Um, but you can convert because so class MA can be used across the building or in combination. And on the subject of com combination, and this is, I think, something which um, uh, Paul has experience in as well, you know, using your class G above, because remember, if I just go back a step, if you're using class MA here over the building, you're not, you're talking about single lets. There's no, there's no HMOs in there. Now, if you combine class G, which then automatically goes to L, you can get your co-living above, and then you can do your single lets on the ground floor. So you get a combination of single lets, apartments, and more higher density, higher yielding uh, co-living HMOs on the upper floor. Uh, Paul, did you want to add anything into that before we move on to the next? I suppose um, sort of the comment around the, the frontage of those buildings being retained for commercial, in my head, the, you know, part of that is policy, you know, it's, it's a, the primary retail frontage, but actually the chances are you're gonna to wanna to keep it anyway, because in those primary retail pitches, the zone A rent's gonna be so high, that actually converting those, unless you're in Mayfair or something, actually the value of the, of the residential you're going to create is going to struggle to compete with a 70 quid a foot zone A or something like that. And therefore, you're never going to kind of get that to stack anyway. So in reality, as you're trying to optimise that scheme, the rear parts, the zone C, the zone Ds and this sort of stuff is where you're going to find opportunities to convert that into resi and where the, where the class MA is really useful. Yeah. So I think whilst policy will say one thing i think in reality you're going to want to keep that anyway you're going to yeah. want to keep that commercial space at the front in in sort of certainly those kind of much much more prime high street locations yeah i agree cool okay so so let's dive into some of the reasons why we kind of look at it as a as, as a strategy certainly coding hmos and that's because it's a high yielding strategy so I'll, I'll give you an example this is a this is a mixed use site where you know it was a shops with uppers i think that's uh, you know the correct term shops with uppers had a three bed flat above it and a retail unit. This building generated 18 and a half thousand revenue. But once we converted it into a five bed HMO, one bed flat, which we did all under prior approval, um, obviously the uppers was already residential, so we could go automatically under PD straight to the HMO. And we generate, we basically pushed the income on the building up to 43 and a half thousand. So we were able to take building and drive the revenue of the building through utilizing permitted developments rights to do that. So that's kind of part of the strategy we're doing. We're taking buildings and we're maximizing the rental income as part of that. Now, obviously, 90% of all the HMO stock that's out there and HMO product that you're going to be competing against is pretty average. But the difference now is that what was acceptable many years ago is not acceptable now. The competition's changed. Uh, you know, your tenants changed. You know, the customers' needs and wants have changed over the years. 
So I thought I'd kind of just give you a quick story of, uh, of uh, Ajaz, uh, landlord that we worked with. And, you know, so that Ajaz, he has uh, a sizable student portfolio. He bought it 10 to 15 years ago. And in his own words, you know, what works 10 to 15 years ago no longer works. So what he discovered was he more players moved into the market. And so what Ajaz noticed was all of a sudden he got hit with the occupancy issues. That's because he hadn't upgraded his product. He hadn't changed his product over the years. More competitors moved into the market. They were creating better quality products and he was hit with occupancy issues. So how do we deal with that? Well, we, we invested in the products. We looked at the product offering, we looked at the layouts, we looked at the amenities, the facilities, and he was able to not only drive his occupancy back up to 100%, but then actually achieve much higher rents than he did before. So what worked many years, years ago will not work now. You're in a more competitive market, we have to adapt to that change. So co-living is the evolution of the HMO into a more community-driven, design-driven product. Uh, these are just a few of, our, of our, our, our sites across the southeast of the UK. And you can see, so it's, you know, very, very, you know, socially driven product. It's a big social, and big emphasis on social spaces, community spaces, co-working, breakout spaces. You know, this, when I was living in uh, HMOs, that, that certainly wasn't around. But one of the things that we found, Paul, is that, that across the board, whether in blue collar or white collar areas, we outperform vanilla and traditional HMOs by 20 to 30 percent. So when you imagine that, you know, most people are looking for you asked me a question at the start about what, what you know, why I moved into into property. Now, I moved into property to create an additional revenue stream. And I looked in the world of HMOs because they're high yielding. And the, you know, the work that we've done with coding HMOs has consistently outperformed the traditional competition and vanilla HMO market by 20 to 30%. Now, why is that useful for us? Well, for a very, very strong reason, which is because uh, we both operate in a world where we're utilizing investment and commercial valuations that, that are driven by revenue. So if you can drive your revenue up 20 to 30%, that's going to affect how much money you recycle back at your deal and how profitable you are. So that's really important, certainly for the uh, optimizing. I, think kind of, so, I suppose the only bit to add on to that, Stuart, is uh, I sort of say this all the time, actually, which is when you think about sort of COVID hitting and sort of being locked down and you think about what your life might be if you're sort of locked up in a one bedroom flat versus being locked up in a, a six bed HMO with five other people that are very similar to, to, to you, mm. that kind of whole experience of, of, in effect, two years being locked up in your own your own kind of four walls if you like it's very different if you've got five other people to go and share it with rather than being locked upon your own in a one bed flat and so i think the the appeal of the hmo especially and the kind of the appeal of a quality hmo where it's a nice feel it's got a nice kind of finish to it is just getting more and more attractive in my head yeah yeah and people want that community around them so you know we're seeing people who want, want that community and also affordability you know uh, it's it's, you know, it's, it can be quite expensive for one bed plus the bills, everything else, and you know all the bills that are going up and various things. So yeah, it's very costly. It's the social aspect, uh, and there's also the affordability. So let's just dive into some of the opportunities on the high street. So firstly, three key areas that we're going to identify before we jump into the case study. So firstly, underutilized retail uppers. Now, these are, you know, we talked about this a little bit earlier on with Class G. These are traditionally, you'd imagine that they were undeveloped. But actually, the opportunity is not just undeveloped. It's existing residential, badly reconfigured. That's really no different than you spotting a house where you could turn a three to a six. It's really no different. It's exactly the same. You spotted a, a, re a residential unit where you can convert a three bed, three into six, into a seven, into eight, into so generous, whatever that is. Exactly the same. So it's existing, you know, uh, residential above commercial that is badly laid out, that is not utilized and not maximized. Um, and then from that, you can use Class L, which we talked about, to turn it into HMOs. Ancillary storage above. Um, this is something I think you mentioned, um, uh, mentioned Paul, which is, you know, if it's ancillary above, then we need to look at different ways to convert. Because obviously, if it's ancillary to the, to the retail, we need to convert it through either Class MA into apartments or Class G into residential and then residential onwards. So either way, we're looking at existing residential and ancillary storage above, above the retail. Uh, other commercial uses, and also the ability to utilize Class G and Class MA as part of doing that. So when we're looking at these buildings, um, one of the big opportunities for everyone is you're not just looking for undeveloped 
commercial uppers, you're looking for residential uppers as well. It's a wide spectrum that contains both of those things because you can utilize both of them from the square footage. So once you've got the square footage, you can work out your ability to convert it. Now, the other, other area of opportunity is the rear parts of retail. So this is, you can see on the diagram on the left, I've just kind of indicated the rear part of the building, which tends to be quite large. So in this one here, we can use class MA for the rear conversion of the building. Previously, part M would have been a, a, the perfect route to do this. We've now got class MA where we can convert the rear of the building. We can create residential apartments if we're doing it under MA, um, which is quite nice because I don't know about you, I, I think as you evolve your portfolio, actually blending in some single lits in with, our, with your main high yielding, I think is a good, um, is a good bit of diversification with what we do. Um, there are a few things I just wanted to highlight about class MA when doing it in commercial, and this is something I've experienced a few times, noise considerations uh, for the units that, that, that adjoin it on the back. If you've got commercial units and you've got fridges and commercial things that make noise, you do want to check that out before you start putting a bedroom next to a wall. Then that wall might have something highly commercial on the other side of it. So have a think about that and just look at it on the floor plans. If your extension touches another one, work out what's in the back of the other one just before you start to lay out. Because it might be where you position a corridor, which is what I've done before. Can move a corridor to the right and then it moves all the bedrooms away from any possible noise. Uh, windows and light, new, new things that we need, to, we need to kind of consider. When you put the plans in, they need to be accurate, minimum space standards. Uh, you do need windows for all, for all bedrooms and you do need to show natural light in there as well. So opportunities for smaller retail units is also, is also something to, to look for because as we're retaining them, as Paul mentioned, if we, if we retain these small units, what we find is they're very attractive for tenants. So these smaller units, you know, uh, could be, you know, we're talking quite small. Some of mine are between 50 to 30 square meters. They're not, they're not particularly big. They're quite small units for like barbers, um, haberdasheries, very, various kind of small uses where, you know, and um, they're flexible class C. So you've got a whole range of, of ways that you can rent them. And this is probably one of the most important things. They're affordable. You know, they are, they are affordable. The high street needs affordable commercial to support businesses. And, you know, they don't need all the storage and they don't need the whole building. So actually providing something smaller, we utilize the rest for resi, residential, and then we, we have more affordable ones there. Um, something you mentioned, uh, uh, Paul, about, you know, post COVID, what people need and what tenants need from their spaces, they don't need all the storage. They don't need to pay for all the stuff that they would have done before. They're actually, they want the frontage. They want the brand frontage to the shop. You know, the, the most expensive, you know, the bit that, that, that is the high performing part, the front half of the, the ground floor to the front. So, you know, we've seen this change in the high street and actually it provides us an opportunity because frankly, we want to do the rears and the uppers. So let's get, let's, you know, utilize smaller, smaller, more affordable commercial ones. And also finally, having an additional revenue stream. You know, my commercial tenants, you know, pay regularly and, they, you know, they sign long contracts and these are, this is a positive thing for us as a, a diverse revenue stream coming in. On the subject of, uh, of the, you know, the shops with uppers and the, the various opportunities that we're, we're just discussing here. Um, now, Neelam is a landlord I worked with where she was looking at all the sites that, that, that traditionally would have been undeveloped up, uppers. So what we, what we helped Neelam uh, look for is sites which actually have residential above. It meant that she actually filled her pipeline and secured a number of sites that she would have thrown away. She didn't even think there was an opportunity there because she just assumed she was looking for under for, for commercial above commercial, not resi above commercial. So suddenly she filled her pipeline as a result of realizing there was more opportunity out there. So let's dive into two case studies. I'm just aware of, aware of time. I just want to make sure I can share this all with you. So this is a commercial site that we converted into an eight bed sewer generis. Uh, this is the one I don't think I've shared anywhere before. So this is a corner corner plot on there. Um, obviously, Paul, you'll recognize this from many of your, your searching around. I, uh, traditional retail on the ground floor. Um, uh, so you've got the parking area at the back, retail area, and then you've kind of got existing residential above, which also has a, there's a second, existing second floor up in that roof as well, which is quite, quite useful. So basically, coming back to what we talked about earlier, uh, Paul, you know, it's already got resi above badly utilized, badly laid out, but nevertheless, there is already resi above there. So what we did is we, uh, this was our kind of plot, it was in the corner here. We were very clear on where we were searching because we knew we could search for the specific use classes. So in Nimbus, so Paul's gonna take you through this a little bit later on, 
you know, when you're specifically looking for these retail units through your Nimbus technology, you can shortlist and find the buildings. Um, obviously, what we do personally is we like to have a certain floor floor plate to the to the building or footprint to the building that we know that we can convert enough square footage out of it. Um, Nimbus is is um, is kind of clever enough to to be able to shortlist that for you, so you can kind of jump into a number of sites. We use it in a very manual way, but we 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 utilize these these tools, which is really uh, powerful for us. So there's two things we did here. We did a prior approval scheme. This was our scheme to get the planning. This was our scheme to get the funding for what we wanted to do. So prior approval, this was the existing building. So you've got commercial on the, on, on the left, on the ground floor, and then you've got a, a kind of maisonette, I think is the best way of describing it, an inefficient maisonette. So prior approval, we were gonna create two apartments there and then a HMO above. You know, um, and that prior approval is what we put through uh, which we which we got back quite quickly. I think within about um, well, in a very short short period of time, we got the approving for that. But simultaneously, we put through a full planning scheme because remember this scheme is a fallback position. So this is our fallback position. Then we put a full planning scheme in for an eight bed sewer generis co-living HMO. You'll notice we've got an extension on the bottom of the building there. We've utilised and got more density out of the building. So we've put a rear extension on the back of the building here which has basically given us uh, more overall space in the building. We couldn't do a double story, unfortunately, because there's a roof terrace on the other side. But we, we had to go right back to brick. We had, there was some insulation issues on the building. Bottom right, you can see we did a rear, we did a rear extension. Uh, we had to stud work it all out for the bathrooms, everything else. So there was um, a fair bit of work we did to the building. It, was, it, needed, <laughs> it needed some major insulation work. However, on a positive side, Paul, we did get a EPC rating of B. Nice. I know, I know, I was very impressed. So we've got B, we've got our APC rating of B, and what that's led to is a cheaper mortgage. So there you go. So this was uh, just going to show you through some of the rooms and how we converted it. You, everyone likes a good before and after shot. We want to take everything through to whitewash and then convert it into the finished product. So this is one of the rooms, decent size. You know, you're talking average 15 square meter bedroom, chill out areas. You've got spaces opposite the beds that you can put the TV, you've got desks, a uh, whole manner of kind of space in there. So large, Kind of co-living spaces this is the rear extension at the back of the building which is completely new which is part of the full planning application and then we converted this into the kind of the final final thing here and actually this 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 a number of rooms on the ground floor along the front of the building also come with private outside space so we've created this kind of little oasis so they've got these little private outside space areas up in the loft which frankly is always a bit of a difficult area without short of putting a dormer in it and everything else but surprisingly you know we took this space and we created a really nice environment in there so this is this room here is 20 square meters you've got this end of it you've got a big walk-in wardrobe down the other end as well and a private bathroom so you know we can convert that into a really really nice product and then we've got a few other rooms which are a little bit more experimental should we say very highly designed uh a few new concepts we've not never done before again trying 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 to kind of push the boundaries a little bit you can see you've got the work workstation in there You've got loads of personalization built into the space. And then all of the rooms, depending on where they are throughout the building, have kind of got private workstations. But, you know, this room here is about, again, it's another 15 square meter room. So lots of little details that we've built into this. Um, and then I just want to show you this shot because this, this is basically the, the commercial. You can see from top left, you know, your standard commercial front door into the building. And then you can see through the photos, we've blocked it up, we've converted it, and gradually we've con converted what was commercial into something that feels very, very, very different. So remember, we had the big ceilings, we had the commercial elements to this, so we could create these, this really nice, engaging social space for people. So we put the soft seating in, we put the central area where everyone can kind of have, have their community space around. Um, you know, and it's a decent, decent amount of space there. I think it's about 25 square meters of social space there, larder units, plenty of storage for everyone. So in fact, if I pivot around this way, you can see, so multiple fridge freezers, I think it's three fridge freezers in here and larder units for, for absolutely everyone. So plenty of storage space. So let's dive into the numbers for you. So we purchased this for 240,000. Uh, that includes a, a lease, uh, a title restriction we needed to, to lift. Uh, refurbishment 171, we did go back to brick. Uh, GDV 630, so very healthy. Uh, cash recycled, nearly all of our money. In fact, Paul, it would have been all of our money. Should it had, had COVID not happened, it would have been all money out, but... <laughs> I got delayed because of COVID, unfortunately. So, um, uh, so anyway, building joke grosses fifty-seven, but you know it generates twenty-four thousand 
net. So I'm, you know, I'm happy with that. ROI, all my money's out in the first year. What the remaining bit that's left in comes out in, in first half of, of the first year. Uh, market room average, 506. Co-living room average is 600. So remember, we're outperforming the market by 19% in a blue collar area. This is a blue collar area. Cool, okay, jump into num uh, case study number two. Again, a standard shops with uppers. Now, interestingly, this particular one, uh, the building is uh, we we retained the commercial actually just to I'll show you similar to what we described before commercial retained on the front you've got single single let and then you can put co-living above so again nice little combination of three revenue streams in there this was the building huge huge extension out the back of the building that you can see there and if I jump down into Nimbus's very clever dual view you can see the barber shop which is just behind the tree so Pretty unassuming. Now, you would not. There is no way that you would have thought that that small little barbershop and that building there was, was kind of home to such a long site with so much volume. And in fact, if you use Nimbus's building footprints, you'll be quite surprised to find 170 square meters on there. So, you know, we, we actually had the opposite problem. We had too much space. So we ended up knocking down some of the extension at the back to build a little patio. So, so that's how we, we, we identified the site. We knew that it had a, a decent amount of space within it that we could convert. Uh, and then we also, our analysis in Nimbus told us we knew what our per square foot rates were. So we knew we had a good sense of if we created a breakaway value for apartments, we could get a sense of what they actually were worth. Now, this building was very derelict. This, you know, and this is something to consider with commercial as well. And Paul's seen a whole range of commercial buildings over his years. And you know, this is this one here is your classic rundown, rundown derelict store, uh, a convenience store. You can see the extension in bottom left hand corner. I mean, the bottom top right hand corner shows you how bad it was. Um, but you know, and so what we did is we used prior approval on this project. So we already had existing residential above, which meant that we can convert that into HMO. Um, which we converted to a five bed HMO. We used prior approval on the ground floor. So the whole, we used it across the whole ground floor and retained some commercial, which you can see there. So we retained a small commercial unit at the front of the development. We did a two bed flat on the rear ground floor, which we then actually rent out by the room. So we either, that's just two more units for the co-living. It's just a smaller, smaller thing. Uh, we did do a full flood risk assessment on this one because it is in an area on the periphery of flood. So we needed to do that. Uh, floor plans and elevations we did as part of it. Uh, capital allowances was an interesting one. We, because this is a mixed use site, we were able to claim some capital allowances on the way in. And we also had a nice way that we could delist the business rates as well. So we delisted the council tax, delisted the business rates while it was un un unhabitable through its period. Um, so it's, again, you need to work with specialists on that. I remember the first day I worked out that you could delist business rates. So I randomly read it in a book and I never knew about it. So um, obviously it's a topic in itself, but if you just, you know, there, as long as you know that there is ways that you can delist business rates on, on these mixed use sites, uh, you need to go to a specialist and they will do the work for a percentage, but someone else does it for you and, and then you can delist it. So this was the site we bought. It was a, you can see, huge commercial on the ground floor. In fact, that's your 170 square meters that Nimbus very, very kind of identified for us. And then what we did is we converted the upper floors into our HMO and we converted the rear, which is the, you can see in the middle, into some more units, uh, created a social space and then also created a small retail shop at the front. Now, these kind of projects, you know, you're going to have some unforeseen things that will happen. I didn't expect to rebuild the top left hand, it's top left hand picture. I didn't expect to rebuild the back of the building. But as Paul will know, commercial buildings do seem to hide a few more gremlins than residential buildings, or certainly the ones I've been buying anyway. <laughs> um, and, you know, uh, sometimes it will go smoothly and you've got to be prepared to have your contingency for this for commercial professions does need to be deeper um, than than standard residential, just because, you know, there's, there's more unseen that this stuff did not come up on the structural survey so you know it was hidden so but what did we convert we created a beautiful building loads of social spaces within it so we big areas of, of kind of social space built in um we kind of had our breakfast bars the chill out areas you know we we, we, we created the high-end product again in the blue collar area this is down in the ground floor so this is part of the bit that was converted our, under class i'm uh, uh, sorry under the uh, prior approval you've got breakout spaces which work really nicely. So if you don't feel social, you want to go somewhere else, you've got these really nice little breakout spaces that you can use. 
So not only do we have these breakout spaces, because we have commercial, and Paul, you'll know from that the square square meterage, we could create we could create all of these quirky little extra large hallways and various bits throughout the building that created these additional spaces. So if you didn't feel social, there was extra little areas within the building you could go to. I'm just now, saying in one of the previous webinars, Stuart, as well, kind of how how especially kind of in a in a sort of a preparing for COVID kind of thing or kind of sort of understand the world post COVID is actually some of these little kind of areas that are very difficult to use in a sort of a more traditional way, actually creating a little place where you can just put a sofa or put a little yeah. table and a couple of chairs or whatever, just kind of creates that, that environment. And you've clearly yeah. done it here very well, haven't you? And it's, um, it's interesting because in residential, chances are you're trying to squeeze more from less. And what we tend to find in commercial is we've got more square footage to play with. And you're entirely right. We've got more to play with. And actually, we can create spaces like this. These breakout spaces are more hard to, to fit in. Unless you've got unhabitable sized rooms in, in a resi. Let's say you've got a resi, you've got an unhabitable sized room. You could utilize it for co-working or a breakout space. But if you don't, then these areas that you're seeing pictures of here, uh, really, when you're converting commercial buildings, and you've got a larger square footage to play with. You can you can build these in. Um, so these are just a few examples of some of the bedrooms, uh, just kind of the style of what we created in the bedrooms. You get a sense of the, the product that we created. So let's look at the numbers on this one. So we purchased 190,000, which was very good price, but then it was pretty bad condition. Uh, refurbishment was 200,000, so it was a rather extensive refurbishment. However, it was worth it because the GDV was 650. So we got a decent GDV on that, which meant they recycled 125% of our funds back out, which it basically means all of our money plus about 70 odd grand, I can't remember the exact amount, somewhere around there. Um, gross rental on the building, 58,000. Profit after cost, two, uh, 20,000 per annum. And ROI is infinite because all our money is out. Uh, market room average, 506. Curly room average in this building because it's got much bigger bedrooms within it. That means we're outperforming traditional vanilla HMOs by 23%. So all of our money out on the project, plus we're outperforming uh, traditional HMOs by 23%. So and it's generating 20,000 20, net return. So again, it just shows you, you know, there's a, the opportunity on the high street for creating these returns. People are always, are always asking me, how do you recycle more money out of pro projects? And I said, well, you've got, to, you've, got to fact, you've got to look at residential, you've got to look at sewer generis, and you've got to look at commercial and you've got to, got to look at all of them and understand the differences of what some have more risk, some have less, some recycle more, some leave some in. And it's, it's, it's all a balancing act. These are just tools, tools that we learn along the way. So what we covered, opportunities on a high street. Number one, underutilized upper floors. And when we say underutilized upper floors, just to clarify, we are saying both underutilized residential and underutilized commercial above retail so both residential and commercial above retail then we're also talking about the rear parts of the ground floor retail so you know the opportunity that when you're looking at these commercial buildings not only you've got the upper floors but in the, you have a strategy for how to deal with and optimize and utilize the rear parts of the ground floor layout and that's why when you look at the floor and you use nimbus to look at the square footage of the uh, of the bit of the footprint of the building you can get a good sense of what the opportunity is without even going near extensions and planning and extra phases of planning permission and everything else. You want to work out what your fallback position is. So you need to get a scheme on the building on a fallback position using prior approval and PD. And then, of course, as, as I do, you could put another scheme in with full planning if you want, but you've got your fallback position. Your fallback position is the funding. Your fallback position is what you'd be happy to do if you didn't get planning. And then finally, smaller affordable retail units, which I think we're both in agreement is, uh, you know, there's uh, not only does it preserve, preserve the high street, but equally you've got a long term revenue stream coming in from it. It's more affordable. People, are, there's more demand for it because it's affordable and it's more flexible for the high street. And I think kind of the, the other bit around it is, is kind of the um, sort of that post COVID world. So the post COVID world of, of the retailer. So a retailer has taken a lease three years ago had one business model and that business model has been turned upside down through COVID. So retailers now have to manage various channels, one of which is their website. The day, the days of just filling a retailer full of stuff and selling it, which is kind of the traditional retail approach, are kind of behind people now and the successful retailers now are, are managing those multiple, multiple channels. Yeah. And really that's kind of where this, this kind of becomes interesting because even if there's a retailer in place, there's a, 
a conversation to be had with that tenant to say, you know, do you really need all this space? Do you want this space? You need more space, less space? Um, because what, what you do know is that their model is very likely very different now from what it was three years ago when they probably signed that lease at the time. And so that kind of, that deal to change the rent, to take the back half off and, and convert it to residential under class MA or, um, or something else is kind of, it's all, it's all there, frankly. So I think that's a really interesting, um, really interesting thing. Yeah. And actually, I, most of these sites that I buy, the commercial sites, are vacant possession because I like to be able to just get straight in there with the builders and start converting the building. But obviously, I appreciate that some people listening today might find might find somewhere with maybe vacant uppers, but a commercial tenant in situ. In which case, what you're what you're describing there is there there could potentially be a negotiation to access. You know, they get something, they get more affordability. They come out of their lease or you know that they've they've signed. They get more affordability. They sign a new lease. You get the you get the rear part, and actually, you can still convert the uppers anyway. Totally, and, and you know, and often, often those tenants will take an overriding lease to the whole building because the landlord won't care and just want to get rid of the the repairing obligation. So yeah. often, you've got a tenant of a retail unit with a bunch of upper space, of upper floors that that they're not using. They've got yeah. a repairing obligation under the FRI lease to go and repair it. You can come in as a new owner and serve a scheduled condition on them and get them to go and repair it, or indeed. You know, surrender it and give it back, and we'll we'll do a deal on the on the on the lease on the ground floor on a smaller unit, depending on kind of what their business needs at that point. So, so I'm certainly in today's market not too worried about the idea of of a tenant being in place and in situ in a retail unit because what you know is that their their needs have changed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, there's plenty of um, the good thing that this is highlighted is, and hopefully this is uh, the case studies I've shown there kind of show that not only can you is the, the opportunity on the high street is much wider than probably people may have initially thought of you know existing with existing uh, resi as well just utilizing buildings and utilizing these new uh, new class ma plus also the older stuff which has evolved like the g's and the l's um and also just getting more being able to convert buildings in a way that you're able to recycle more money back out because as people many of the people listening uh, today uh, might be struggling with some residential trying to make the numbers stack on residential and you know those numbers are being squeezed it's being squeezed harder and people finding it harder to make them stack so of course you know more people now are attracted to other ways to kind of recycle more money so i think you you have to look if you're looking at your strategy and you can always kind of correct cash flow uh minimize your risks and um and, and, and recycle more of your funds to create more of a portfolio you've got to look at the whole breadth of skills available to us and and that has to include from residential to sewer generis, from sewer generis into commercial. Totally. And the so I suppose, um, let's just move on then. So I suppose the next question, um, if I can just change that is, so just do it kind of pre, if you can imagine a world pre Nimbus, and there, it was a, there was a thing, a life pre Nimbus, but um, sort of in a world pre Nimbus, kind of how did you find this sort of stuff? How do you find opportunities like, um, how do I find a house I can convert to, to, to C4, um, how do I find a, a shop with vacant uppers or um, space to the rear? Kind of what, what would that typically look like historically? Uh, what, how would I have done it previously or how do I do it now? Previously, oh, um, agents, who you know. Mm. You know, you would have to just rely on, I mean, I, bear in mind, you know, I, I, a lot of my portfolio is Brighton & Hove. And unfortunately, Brighton & Hove is, because I grew up nearby, I know a lot of the owners of the agents. So it's all about getting the nod on something before. And, you know, most of my deals have been done in less than one hour. So I get the nod, it's coming to market, I get to the site, I'm there within one hour, the deal's tied up and never hit the market. So you have to, I have to, I mean, if I'm buying something at Brighton & Hove, I can't, I have, I have to move that quickly. I drop everything, I go. Um, however, I appreciate that in different in different areas, we call it the so less hot areas. Um, it just doesn't move that quickly. In fact, sometimes I'm trying to move as quick as I do in Brighton and Hove, and I turn up and they're like, "It's okay, it's not going on the market just yet." <laughs> 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 so actually, it depends whether you're in a hot market or whether you're further out. You know, into like blue collar areas. If you're in blue collar areas, people are not moving as quickly. But I still think that speed speed has always been something that even even if you are a new, a new player on the market and you'd, you'd think that all the big developers have got this tied up, they get, they get, less, they get less quick. So if, as long as you've got speed on your side, relationship and speed, you can sometimes swoop in there, sometimes even before the big developers get there or you know, the known developers get there. And the speed is to keep it off market, is it? Yeah, look, the way I look at it is 
if I'm actually two things, I, I try and secure a deal. And then if you secure a deal, even if I'm paying the market rate of it, I'm, I'm avoiding a bidding war. The other thing that I'm doing as well, again, this is just a technique, Paul, I don't know if you've done this on your sites, but I sometimes use cash just to get it off the market. Doesn't mean my cash is permanently tied up. So then, you know, that, that, that's the first site that I shared with you, the eight bed sewer generis. I bought that cash. So I swooped in. I negotiated £60,000 off the asking price for cash. So that would, if I got to the end of that deal, that would have been left in. Yeah. So I negotiated it off, I bought it cash. And then what I did is as soon as I got planning, my site, which was, was originally 215 and sorry, 240 when you take off the lease uh, type restriction, suddenly jumped from there to 360 on the paperwork that I got on my prior approval. <laughs> mm. So my cash then got swapped out when I got that, when I got that, when I got the planning and the GDV valuation. So cash can be a very good mechanism or if you've got the ability to temporarily use it to secure the site and then swap it back out after for funding. Yeah, sure. I suppose the interesting thing that for me on, on that was that you're working quite hard to keep the thing off the market, frankly, or sort of trying to get it before it hits the open market. So you're not in the competitive world of, of, yeah. of kind of bidding wars and this sort of stuff, really. And, and I suppose the other way of doing that is to, is to let a campaign and, and generate the opportunities yourself, really. Well, that, um, that didn't... That didn't why well, so the only way that that existed many many years ago was going on to Lamridge, i believe and then trying to go Lamridge manually and then and then trying to do that and obviously very very manual way of doing it but obviously you know the software and nimbus and you know software tech software for land was not available uh, back then and so we had to do it manually um whereas the difference now is i can do it a few clicks of a button i can search for square footage i can look for planning history i can work out the volume and then work out the calculations of how many apartments I'll get it out of it, or how many, if I look at the square footage above on the retail uppers, straight away you should be able to work out how, much, what, how many bedroom HMO you'll get there. How many, how, many win how many windows have you got and what square footage you've got? And you should be able to roughly work out what you can get from that quite quickly. So obviously I didn't have that tech before. So now how do I, so coming back to your question, how do you find the sites now? Well, the difference now is firstly, you do still have to do the agents. You've still got to kind of do that part. But now you're layering in tech on there as well. So the tech allows you to basically identify the buildings you want at the volume you want, at the, you know, the volume of space. And then you can go direct to vendor in a way, in a more systemized way than you would have done previously. Totally. Should we try and do it? Brilliant. Let's go do it. Right. So let's jump into... Um, this so we're going to go find a deal quickly is the is the answer we're going to go and see if we can find um shops with uppers where we can look at then um where would we carve the back half off how would we how would we make all that work in effect and so i'm going to do this live and so this is um your chance to trip me up maybe or to um see where we want to go to and ravinder i think has has um has preempted my question so where would we like to go and search to be my question ravinder has has popped in amersham into the um into the search we're going to go off and we're going to find a deal in amersham let's, go hunting. Let's, go, let's go hunting in amersham let's go hunting in amersham so so this is the nimbus um uh maps platform here so for those of you who sort of don't know what uh nimbus does so this is sort of the the search bar at the top if you like and what it's done it's gone off and found the center of amersham for me and plotted the sort of the freehold properties around uh, around that and each one is kind of clickable we're going to sort of use these later on but i'm going to jump into a thing i'm going to clear this search for a second so so this is um amersham here in effect the first thing i want to understand is i want to understand a little bit about this place before i start going and finding stuff i don't want to kind of just really nearly um shoot at amersham and see what i find and so the first thing i want to do is i want to just look at the um at the average sales price of residential property across amersham in effect and i'm doing this to understand the quality of the area we're looking i want to get a picture of where does amersham sit relative to the, the area that, it, that it's showing in and so what this does here, so having so use the location analysis tool on the right here, I can I can layer stuff onto the map. And, and the first one that I've done is the is the average residential value. And the reason I've done this, so what this is doing is going off and it's looking across these little kind of white lines uh, and neighborhood boundaries that we get from the census in effect. It's going off and saying, what are all the houses and flats and everything that's sold in those areas? How big were they? And what's the, the sale price divided by the size of them and averaged out? So what's the average rate per square foot that residential properties are selling across um, across Amersham. Now, in the case of Amersham, what's kind of interesting is that it's actually a pocket of very high value, which out towards the sort of, if you go kind of west and or south, 
west southwest or whatever it is towards High Wycombe, those values tumble off very quickly. So what I can see actually is we're in a, a pretty affluent um, uh, sort of area when we sit and look at um, Amersham as opposed to kind of Chesham um, up to the north and, and High Wycombe out to the, to the west. And so I'm naturally kind of erring on the side in Amersham of, of Resi actually rather than HMO. That's kind of what's kind of going through my head at the moment. Yeah, the other thing you can double check as well, you've got your HMO layer, which um, is quite a fascinating overlay, this one that, that you have in, in, in Nimbus, because interestingly, I end up using this to tell me where their pockets of uh, data is telling me how many HMOs are in the market. So you can see High Wycombe, look, High Wycombe has lots of HMOs. So this is kind of really pointing me at what my what the model should be for Amersham in effect. So so by looking at Amersham here, so what this is, what, um, what uh, Stuart's asked me to do is to put the, the HMO overlay on. And what that, what that shows me is all the registered HMOs in that location in effect. So, so looking at Amersham, I'm sort of not crazy excited by the, um, by the idea of putting HMOs there because there's really only one registered HMO um, in the centre of Amersham and there's one a bit further north and this sort of stuff. And when you compare that to somewhere like um, uh, High Wycombe, there's a much bigger marketplace in High Wycombe um, or indeed out towards kind of Watford and places like that. You've got a much sort of bigger marketplace for the HMOs that, you've, that you're looking for. Mm. So what I would be kind of very tempted to do is to move across um, into High Wycombe and be looking there instead. So um, there's a question. Hemel, 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 is it Hemel Hempstead? Up to the northeast. Yeah. So again, what's kind of interesting with this is that if we just apply that, that overlay in effect, what you can kind of see is that really where those values are kind of weaker, we've got a much higher density of, of HMOs in effect. And that really means I should probably be focusing in those areas. And actually, I could be looking at standard shops of uppers in, in Amersham. I'm going to be going for two flats above, just stick with C3 Resi. Thanks very much, off we go. So because today we are talking HMOs, I'm going to take your Amersham, I'm going to raise you a High Wickham or indeed a, um, a Hemel Hempstead. Where would we like to go, Stuart? Do you want to go north, east or south west? Let's go. This uh, well, it seems to be a bigger concentration in Hemel Hempstead, doesn't it? A lot of okay. an industrial state. Let's, the right, let's go and have a look in Hemel Hempstead. Fabulous. So, 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 so. Let's kind of zoom in there. Let's remove um, the average residential value. So let's first off. So we've got some residential value, not kind of huge amounts. But we've got some residential value, you know, kind of four hundred pound a foot, three fifty, three seventy five, whole chunk up here in effect. So what I'm going to do next, I'm going to jump into our um, Elite Plus system just for a moment. I'm going to use um, a little tool in here. So we have this sort of Elite Plus system gives us these kind of um, uh, sort of data analytics driven site finding in effect. And um, what do I mean by that? Well, what it means is I can click a button, which in, in the face, to, in, in effect, the, um, the class G shops with uppers. And what it does, is it goes off and it finds me all the shops um, across the map, tells me then, well, there's upper floor space that's in a, a sort of a low value use that then I could look at converting to residential in effect. So, so what I'll find is in the center here, hopefully, um, and this is completely live, so fingers crossed it all kind of um, finds me exciting stuff, but I'm pretty confident it's going to. What we can look at is then what I really want to do is I want to find a similar kind of opportunity to the one that, um, that Stuart's just shown you in effect. And so what this is showing me here is that there's sort of a bunch of retail properties along here. Those retail properties then have some upper floor space. It's lower value than the, than the surrounding area. And of course, we're in a, a sort of a reasonably... Um, low value area because I've kind of chosen that particularly because of an HMO concentration around here. We want to use class G on the upper parts and then class L on the upper parts to, um, to give ourselves those, those HMOs in effect. So I'm going to just pick um, any old one of these. So I'm clicking on this, this particular property here. There's one there. It's got 1,500 square feet above, um, above the ground floor with a very low um, base price again. So let's just kind of look at this particular property for a moment. So I've clicked on on the, on the sort of the, the panel on the right, which is from the Elite Plus system. And what it's showing us down here then is this commercial uses and rate assessment in effect. So it's showing me then the, um, the rate assessment for that particular building. So why is that interesting? Well, the reason that's interesting is with a sort of sales price around here of 400 pounds a foot, 450 a foot, something like that, which is kind of came off that overlay. And we've got some comparables I'll show you in a moment to kind of really pin down that number. What it's showing me is, is what the district value, so the, the rate assessment is what district value were thought the rent of this building was back in 2015. Now, the questions we've raised today have been, well, what if we convert the upper parts? What if we convert the ground floor at the back? And how do we work out which bits of this building we wanna go and convert? Well, 
one of the comments that I made a moment ago was that the front part of these buildings is often at a very high value because it's kind of the zone A, it's the really kind of um, a high value retail pitch at the front of the, of the units in effect. And so what's kind of interesting is that when we look at these numbers here, so this rate assessment shows me what the district value were thought the rent of each of the component parts of this building were back in 2015. And so I can see at the first floor um, of this particular unit, it's got £1.74 worth of rent from 2015. So in today's money, that may be £3 or something like that, maybe sort of three quid a foot. If I paid 7% yield for this, I'm probably paying, it's probably 40 quid a foot in effect of what I'm paying for that, for that rear part or sorry, for the upper parts of that building. If I look at the zone C at the front here, you know, £8.74, maybe it's, maybe it's £12 now, which means that if I then um, buy that, that sort of part of the building, 12 quid's worth of rent, maybe I'm paying one fifty a, a foot for it. In effect, I can convert it for maybe £100 a foot, maybe for 250 something like that. And suddenly my £400 a foot sales value gives me um, scope to convert the back half of this site under Class MA, which is what um, Stuart's just been talking about. And of course, the upper parts, again, are at lower value. If I compare that to the very front of that building, that building is £35 a foot back in, in 2015. So maybe it's 40, 45, 50 pounds a foot in terms of rental level at the front. That means if I pay a sensible yield for it, it's worth 600 pounds a foot. Therefore, I've got no chance of converting that for 100 pound a foot. I'll be in for 700 quid a foot to create space that's worth 400. Of course, I'm not going to go and do that. Which means that very quickly, I can work out which parts of the building would stack up to convert and which parts of it, which, which parts of it won't. So the Elite Plus system has zoned me in to say there's upper floor space here that works, but at the same time, we've now got Class MA, that means I could, um, I could unlock space at the back of it. And the beauty, I suppose, of the particular property that I've chosen, of course, is that it has a rear, a rear road as well. So I can access off the back here and very simply convert the, the back parts of that building in effect. So it's really kind of as simple as that. Once you've found those opportunities in this way, what you can then do is you can use this kind of this, this tool we call workflow here, where I can sort of save a property into workflow. And from that, what it does is it, it sort of loads it into this kind of Kanban board of, of opportunities in effect. And I can then download those into Excel and I can then let a campaign from there very simply. I can either use the, the Excel file that downloads all of these, these sites with the owner's details in. I can either use that file with a mail merge and send letters out very quickly that way. Or I can use a tool like Stamp or Doc Mail or UK Mail um, and load my letter template into it along with this um, Excel file you get from Nimbus to then very quickly letter campaign in effect. So that's really kind of as simple as and that sort of that, that, that base part of it, if you like. I suppose the other bit that kind of could be interesting as part of this is sort of two things really. So number one um, is, I suppose there's some HMOs sort of sat around here that that kind of could be interesting. Um, and so what I was going to just do is to pop the, um, the, the HMO C3 to, to HMO and to see where do we see sort of a low density of, 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 um, of, of HMOs in an area around a particular residential property. And so what this does here is it says, well, here's a little cluster of HMOs around here. So actually looking in this area for more HMOs could be very interesting. Mm. This is kind of now moving off a of high street, but actually it's kind of interesting for today's um, for today's comment, really. And I suppose what I'm trying to show here is that there's an HMO here that's been, that's been developed. Um, and actually, some of these buildings then are a bit smaller than that. So if I was to click on this one here, I can see that this particular property here is actually a house. That house um, has a density of 17%. Kind of interesting because what that 17% means is that's less than some of these other properties on here. So some of these buildings are much bigger than this particular one. So I can extend it and put more units into it. In fact, actually, number 86, the one which is the HMO, has got an interesting block they've put straight to the back, you see. And they've got, actually, exactly, they've got more units at the back, haven't they? Yeah, absolutely, there. absolutely. And so maybe we could do the same thing and actually access off the rear and put one of these at the back as well, perhaps another, another unit, or indeed come through and, and sort of access it through the front and, and have that extra unit um, at the back. And one of the questions in the chat was, can we tell if it's an Article 4 area? Well, what this is showing me here, that actually this isn't Article 4, so I could actually use... Um, my class L PD rights on that particular property go and convert that straight into HMO. Thanks very much. Well, yeah, I mean, on buildings like that, you've got a strip. It's interesting because that strip you've got there is you've got a set secondary road access on that on that back. So you know, you know, you've only got to get be in. You know, you've only got to spot something on the back there where someone's tried to get some form of residential on the back, and actually, you've you opened up that whole run of buildings where potentially there could be 
extra residential development opportunity on the rear because this because the you may have that up. you may have that. i don't know if that's access through here or whether that's come through here because it may well be that you've got that that sort of precedent set there and certainly got it up here aren't you, i suppose so well, um, these, these buildings that you've got highlighted there if you've got effectively a non-article 4 pd you could um depending on the price of the building you can convert them under your pd rights work out how many rooms you get there and then you then you've got a secondary bit of planning potentially on the ground and the, on the the um the rear the of the back. site absolutely yeah. absolutely so I thought that perhaps was helpful. And I suppose the other bit that um, Stuart was talking about a moment ago was just around the um, around the comps, actually. I'm just going to zoom out a little bit and just um, see where we are again. Let's just go and find a few more of the um, a few more of those HMOs. So what we can then also do is we can then pop the um, the residential comparables on. So I'm just going to see if I can get a bit lucky with this. So so what this will allow me to do here is to is to show residential properties that have sold, say, in the last um, the last couple of years. Now, what this is going to show me is, in effect, these are all the properties across that area that have that have sold and the prices that they sold for. Um, so I can sort of see a general tone of what those sales prices are. And um, what I suppose I was kind of interested in doing, in fact, it's going to let's just do a little um, search around, uh, maybe around here. Let's just see if we get lucky. I want to just do a little um, area search along here and say, show me all the um residential comps apologies you know, two seconds just to um to pull that through oops there we go and if i export those comparables what i'm hoping to find is just a little bit of evidence around what the what the sales prices are for hmos in that area so can we find some um some some hmos that have sold in this area um just here so let's give that a let me just open up my in my screen here and actually what you're touching on to that, Paul, is quite interesting because it, it is notoriously difficult to value HMOs. Yeah, so what we've got here sort of immediately is there's a property there that sold 370,000. Let's, let's kind of do this properly rather than... Um, so in effect, what we have is um, along here, let's put the filters on to make this a bit, bit simpler. But there's a column here. So this is showing all the properties that have sold in that little area that I drew. And um, it's showing me the price they sold for, the date they sold, how big they were, um, what that is a rate per square foot is then indexing that up to today's date in case stuff was sold a while ago to kind of understand what today's value of that sale was if things have sold historically. And then it links it through to say, well, actually, has that, is that then, was that sold with an HMO um, license in place? And so what you can see is actually this particular property, which was 27 Tamar Green, sold in March of, of last year, just under 12 months ago, 370,000. In today's money, so over the course of the last year, that value has gone up from 370 to 385 using um, local house price index to, to inflate that up. But that sold then as a, as a six bed HMO. So when it, when it sold, it had a, a, a recent HMO um, license in place from February 2019, where that license said it was a six bed HMO. So suddenly we've got kind of a feel for it's kind of worth 385 as a as a kind of index, as a, as, a, as a value in effect, and it was a six bed HMO at the time. So mm. quite quickly we could kind of build that picture. And I suppose what's perhaps also useful is that knowing that it's 27 Tamar Green, is that we've actually then got a link through on the far right over here um, to go and check it out on Rightmove and just see if we can see any, any if, if the property was sold on Rightmove, it would then give us a, um, a little view of that to say well, what the particulars and what did it look like and were the beds in, bed, beds in good condition, bad condition, Kind of does it look like a, a next level HMO, kind of a, you know, a sort of a, a co-living space that Stuart's been talking about, or is it um, something rather less glamorous than that in effect? So, so hopefully that is all useful. Um, just trying to bring this up. For some reason my computer has suddenly started whirring around in the background. So I'm just worried that um, my computer is uh, suddenly struggling for some reason. But in effect, it's sort of very quick for us to go and find those, um, those opportunities. So, so hopefully what I've brought to life is that firstly, we can go off and find those C3 properties to convert to um, HMO, see whether it's Article 4 or not. We've also then used the, um, the Class G shops and uppers, where of course, knowing there's no Article 4 in, in this location, we can then use Class L on the upper parts for those properties. We've sort of seen how quick it is to go and find first the upper floor space we can convert, and equally at the same time, look at the rear parts of those retail units. So well, actually, which of those then would um, would neatly convert banks very much um, based on the on the, the prices that are around there. Hopefully, all that is clear and simple. 
So um, should we dive into some questions? If there's some... That's what I was just thinking. Yeah. So what I'd like to do now is um, just before we get ourselves ready for some questions, I'm just going to launch a quick poll. We're just going to take a very brief, um, a brief moment just to get ourselves ready for the questions. Um, I'm going to launch a quick poll. So if you'd like to learn more about Nimbus Maps, the first question is there. If you'd like a follow up with um, with Stuart's um, the guys at Coding Space, that second question is for you. We're just going to take a short break for a moment and then. Um, we'll come back and we'll answer some questions. So if you can get your, your microphones at the ready and we'll be back very shortly. Fabulous. So let's just get um, Stuart back as well. So if you'd like to ask a question, what I'd like to do is to um, open your Zoom control panel. What you should find on there is a little raise hand button. If you could click on that for me, then we'll we'll bring you up here and we'll um, we will get your answers, us your questions asked, and hopefully answered as well if we uh, if we can do our job successfully. So I'm just going to switch that poll off. Um, so I think Venu raised his hand first. So let's just see if we can bring um, Venu up. Hi, Venu. Hi, hi there. Hi, Stuart. Hey. Uh, thank you so hi, much. Good day. Um, I must say what you're doing is extraordinary, actually. It's quite uh, eye-opening. Thank you so much for sharing, actually. Um, so basically, I just wanted to ask, uh, I've seen a property which is in the conservation zone but uh, it is not in the article four just outside the article four it is a mixed use property and downstairs is a cafeteria upper two floors is got a four bed flat there. um so that is the layout and uh, the problem with this is there is no separate access to the upper floors uh, um so you have to go through the between the tables in the cafe mm -hmm. uh, okay. to get to the staircase but the good thing is the external door and the staircase are exactly on the same side and they are in line basically if there is a, if the if the council permits they can build a straight wall from the staircase to the outer door and then uh, you can build a separate uh, hallway to the upper floors uh, at the same time in that new wall we can put um, uh, a door into the cafe so without any changing any uh, uh, you know uh, front elevation we can uh, we can create that but uh, my only concern is um, Will the council permits begin the conservation area? Everybody is saying that the PD rights doesn't apply to mixed use properties, flats, masonets, and so class, yeah. So class L and class G. Um, I'm okay. I'm wrong, Stuart, but it doesn't matter about um, conservation areas. It doesn't matter on conservation areas for class MA, um, yeah. but not for class G. Yeah. So yeah. the rear part of the ground floor you'd need to think about, um, but class MA you just need to do a, um, an impact assessment on it. So I wouldn't be too worried about that. It doesn't preclude class MA. You just need to do an impact assessment about the on the conservation area. Yeah. So I would feel it just it just means that that you know that you're when you're measuring your risk on the project, you've you got to really get your get your high density out of the upper floors. And then like, like you say, you're gonna put, put a um feasibility study on with your planning consultant on, on the rear part, which if it's not contentious, it just means you don't have it guaranteed from that. It doesn't mean that you're not gonna get it because if it's underutilized rear, then it shouldn't be controversial anyway. But it just means that you can't just go straight in. Even if you're, even if you're doing um, sort of a full planning application for, for the rear part of the retail, then it's just typically a sort of a, um, an agent's report about the, the attractiveness of the new unit at the front rather than um, the bit at the back. We did that in a, in a thing in Leamington. We sort of um, carved the chunk off the back of a 4,000 square foot retail unit, kind of secondary location, and support it with, a, with, the, um, with the agent, the letting agent's kind of detail, you know, a report on it sort of whistled through, to be honest. So... So I think you've got class MA for the rear, but you need to do an impact assessment on the conservation area. Yeah. The upper part sounds ideal, you know, four bed flat in the centre of town above a retail unit. It doesn't sound like it's 
the C3 is the right thing for it. It's um, very much like C4 is the right thing. And um, if it's not in the Article 4, then you should be good anyway. Article 4 doesn't necessarily preclude you doing the, um, the change from C3 to C4 anyway. It's just a planning application. You need to know the density of HMOs around it. So yeah, because this sounds exciting. Theory, you're if it, if it was in Article 4, you'd be basically held, because conservation would have been meant that you need planning on the ground floor, <laughs> mm. and then Article 4 would have meant you need planning upstairs. So at least, you know, potentially you're, you know, you can do your conversion upstairs, but you're going to, you just have to have a bit of a strategy for, for the, um, the planning consultant to just do a quick feasibility on the, on the rear of the ground. Mm. So, <clears throat> um, I mean, uh, the, my Im imminent, uh, imminent uh, issue is, um, building a wall between the, with the staircase and creating a separate access to the upper floors. Um, conversion of the, uh, by the way, uh, there is not much rear uh, space. It's uh, the, you've got a front seating area and then you've got a coffee making area and then you've got a commercial kitchen and then you've got a storage at the very back, all in uh, like a very long uh, ground floor, basically. So there is no extra space behind to build anything. Um, so my imminent thing is I want to really try difficult of having difficulty in working out whether I can build a wall or not. Uh, will the council objects? Do I need a planning permission? Uh, well, us usually on a lot of my projects, I have many of the buildings that I bought a commercial did not have a separate access. Exactly as you describe you in you're in the building and the owner who lives there goes up from the back of the shop up to the flat. So I had to basically slice off on the side a separate mm -hmm. access to the flat. Yeah, uh, ne I never had any issue with regards to planning creating any of these but again i'd go straight to a planning consultant uh get your high density above and then get them to look at what the most uh, least impact scheme is to move forward and then kind of look at what your strategies are with with purchase and whether or not you can mitigate some of that risk on the purchase yeah. okay so i cannot go ahead with the property without uh, a planning consultant and uh, you by you utilizing the law i, I, cannot go I, would, I would check it with the planning consultant i'm check. not convinced that you can't do just do that but mm -hmm. i think you get, get some planning advice on that if mm -hmm. you've got two existing existing planning units it depends if you've got two existing units whether it's ancillary or not and if it's ancillary then can you carve it off separately and so yeah. I, I think i'd just get some planning advice on that if i were you the yeah. very first, if you are, if, if you're doing commercial conversions, you, having a planning consultant that you can throw a site at and to double check what you think you can do, you can do from, for me is, you know, that has to happen. It's the very first thing. Mm. To do. The good thing about this property is uh, it stacks up with upper two floors itself uh, because I can create a five large double bedrooms. Uh, so even if uh, I leave the commercial space empty, until I finish everything in the upper floor, that's fine. Uh, so for the down floor, da downstairs, I mean, uh, if you slice off a space from the commercial premises, then that's gonna narrow down um, a cafeteria basically. So you'll have only single column of tables uh, instead of the two columns. So with that, if I can't rent it, my, I, my thinking was um, to put a bedroom at the back uh, where the commercial storage space and the commercial kitchen is with an ensuite room and the front coffee making area and the seating area, leave it as an open plan uh, for the guests uh, to sit, dine and relax. So use the entire building as a service accommodation. Um, is it something considered as a commercial or uh, does the council permits in a conservation zone or is it classed as a residential partly? Sorry, what, if, you, if you do service accommodation, did you say? Uh, yes, if if I if I, uh, upper two floors is very clear. If I can build, a, if you can build a wall. Upper two floors is clear for yeah. me. Uh, use as a HMO. Um, but the downstairs cafeteria, if I cannot rent after slicing of the space as a commercial yeah. unit, yeah. my alternate plan is I can put a bedroom with ensuite at the back, um, where there is a, a commercial, you know, fridge freezer and the commercial kitchen is there. Uh, leaving the coffee making area in between and also the front seating area um, as an open, you know, living and dining and watching telly and relaxing. Well, I think that's a change of use. So I think you want to you want to carve off a, a commercial unit at the front because you, otherwise you're changing the use of the ground floor retail front at the front. And if that's you're then in a conservation area, so you class MA, you need to kind of demonstrate the impact of that. So you're into um, full playing. That may well be that's the, the right thing to do, but I'd look at the values of that and make sure that changing the front part of the retail unit is actually um is actually worthwhile doing whether you're going to drive the same value out of that yeah so I, I would think you're much more you're like to be much more akin to what Stuart's done historically where you've got a small unit at the front which mm. stays in commercial use 
could, you can still keep that unit, you know, put another bedroom at the back on the ground floor. Yeah. You maybe could get that through as part of a planning application. Mm. Get your <laughs> baggy change of use upstairs of class L, go back in for a second one to get your extra unit on the ground floor and then yeah. keep the front bit as, as commercial. Yeah, because you know, normally you'd imagine you put in a unit, if you haven't got enough for a, a whole dedicated one bed flat or a two bed flat at the back of the, the ground floor, you can still do an extra resi that joins into the back of upstairs, but it's still a planning app, but it's joining into the volume upstairs so it doesn't have to meet the minimums in the minimum size because it can just be one extra bed and that is um, that's morphed into the upper floors to get you from mm -hmm. maybe a five to a six or whatever that is so um and plus um yeah. just you can get the it's a change of use in the ground floor that's a problem i uh, hopefully that helps helps for now i'm just aware we need to get through some questions but hopefully that helps you yes thank you uh, but this is one last thing a quick one if i uh, do you offer any kind of uh, any training mentorship or anything well, well, Paul's got an amazing bit of tech <laughs> that he sells. Yeah, of course, Nimbus they're offering. In terms yeah. of uh, the actual uh, yourself, Stuart, actually, do you offer any kind of? Uh, and Paul is offering a Nimbus. That is, I know that. Uh, but in terms of the training and uh, finding deals and. Uh, so yeah, um, you know, I I train I train landlords on how to source the sites, convert the sites, and then convert them into coded in HMOs. So um, I think when um, Paul sent sent out that 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 link a minute ago. If yes. you um if you request a phone call with me, yeah, I can take it take you through it then. Amazing, thank you so yes. much. No, I just want to pop your email address into the um into the chat as well, and then um, yeah. then you can pick up you directly that way as well. Brilliant. Just, just, yeah. just yeah. a minute. The calling space is email, isn't it? Uh, it, it oh, is. The numbers. Well, if you um if you if you paste your um if you paste your email address into the chat into, into okay. Paul, then we just we just means that it's captured in the in the chat and then we can reach out to you as well. Ah, uh, okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, right so we're at time. I want to get through a few more questions. See if we can get Anastasia up. Let's see if we can ask you to unmute yourself, Anastasia. Uh, struggling with Anastasia to unmute herself. Let's get Kunwar up as well and see if in the meantime we can see if. Hi, Kunwar. Hi, hi, guys. How are you? Hi, um, Hello. You Thank you for this. It's wonderful. And Paul, it's great to be on this again. I think a lot of questions have been answered, so I'll keep mine super short and uh, to the point. So uh, with one of your projects, you said you had a small uh, frontage as a commercial, as you didn't wish to change the business use and license, which is perfect. Now, um, if I was to, because I'm a, a residential landlord, I have a few properties already. If I'm moving into this direction, would I need to like kind of prepare a business plan for the lending institution or a bank to say, well, look, here's this commercial place. This is what we're going to do with it. Or would they just be satisfied on the basis that, well, technically we're going to leave commercial, but we're going to focus on the uppers and convert it all into residential. And this is what we plan to claw back from the residential. Do you, do you uh, see what I'm getting at here? It's really, it's really not that complicated. Kind of it's, it's, um, it's actually more simple than that. It's so you're probably, if you're in, if you're a resi landlord, you're probably using a lot of the standard lenders like Kemp Reliance and yes. some, you know, Precise, those guys. That's it, Pepper Money and all of them. When, yeah. you, when you move into commercial, you know, you move into slightly different lenders uh, like Lend Invest or, 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 or Shawbrooks or Interbay or various lenders that, 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 that will take on mixed use sites or, or sewer generics, depends what you create out the back of it. Um, and pretty much they're going to look to your experience as a landlord. Now you've already got landlord experience. Right. So, I don't think you'll have any issues with regards to the funding and the um, uh, securing of the sites because of your landlord experience. So really the preparation, I think, uh, for you is more making sure that you know what to do with the sites. So mm -hmm. the types of due diligence to do, what to look for when you're, when you're convert, you know, you're building, when you're, you know, how you're using the planning, how, um, you know, we were just talking to Vinu about how to mitigate a bit of risk when you're going through from the, from the you know, like the, the fallback position of the, what's guaranteed through prior approval and, and PD versus what you get planning for. So really, I, I would focus more on, on the due diligence of the actual assessing and stacking and uh, uh, securing the sites. But the funding of the sites, um, you're going to be paying slightly higher rates. You might be going from bridging and then in to the yeah. final product. Yeah. Really, strictly speaking, your experience will, will be sufficient for what you need to do. You don't need a full business plan for medium, small to medium scale. Commercial, that's, yeah, that answers, that's fantastic. And what are the loan to values? One oh, sorry, Paul, did you, do you want to add something? Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. the other thing you can do, um, so so last week I did a webinar with um, Ian Humphreys of Brickflow. Um, so you kind of check out that. So on the information panel on Nimbus, you've got the sort of look at, you can look at what the funding opportunities are. Um, okay. And so they will then give you um, kind of, it's like money supermarket in effect for, for development finance. So I would look at them and they've got a very nice little kind of tool where 
you sort of load in various documents in effect to kind of support what you're doing. And so last week we talked kind of at length about how to approach lenders and how to kind of to, to build that case for them. And for me, you know, having a nice clear set of comps is kind of important, a nice clear development appraisal that explains kind of what you're doing, why you're doing it, what the values are and how that stacks up. Um, and then also details around your track record, but equally, if you haven't got a track record in that kind of that kind of opportunity, you could use something like the planning export um, on Nimbus to go and find consultants that have done similar schemes to the ones you're doing. So they would then help build that um, that kind of that kind of support for the fact that this thing's going to go ahead and you're going to get it away and you're going to get planning for it because actually you've got a really really great team around you that's supporting that. And obviously, you know, or or tap into someone like um, or you know, Stuart. Stuart will kind of help with um, with that support and training and build that credibility that way. Or you can do it the other way with um, building your design team around you and, and going forward and make sure you're building that kind of complete case um, for the bank. And so also, you've got a, you know, are going to want a GDV valuation anyway. They're going to do they're going to do effectively a GDV valuation, a gross development value yeah, valuation yeah. on the building to assess that what you think you can do with it, you can right. do with it. So they're going to end up wanting that level of detail regardless. And when they, when you turn up, then obviously one of the other things that we show landlords how to do is create the value of pack and how you put that together. So what Paul's just touched into there is you get the comps, you get the information, you get the stuff about the rent roll, the cost, everything else, bring that all together. And then that forms a basis of being able to power this uh, GDV valuation that would be required anyway from the lender. And sometimes I, I end up, I sometimes do them in advance myself. I just pay independently for them. If I yeah. want GDV valuation, I can do the same thing. So it's just due diligence. These are just tools. You, you, you know, I came from resi and then went into commercial in the same way you, you know, you, you're in residential now and your, your toolkit and the types of buildings you look to convert and the types of planning you use to do that, it's just going to widen your toolkit. That's all. That's brilliant. And I mean, I am kind of doing that with the package that I'm producing for the current res resi purchases. Final, final question. Uh, when you look at commercials, what kind of loan to values, though it's going to be differing, but what kind of loan to values do they give? Is it same as uh, resi or do they say that 25% you need to as a deposit or do they need more from you? Uh, well, again, I, I put it through the, there's a calculator on um, on Nimbus that would, so if you go onto on the information panel for a particular property, you can then Click the the brick flow link, which says you no know, search loans for whatever it is. If you click on that, oh, okay. they'll take you through a. You can oh. fill the details out, tell them what tell them what it is, and they'll tell you um, what you like to be able to achieve, what kind of deposit you'll need, um, what the rate to like to be in, and so you know. And you can also look at so you can look at vanilla senior vanilla senior debt. You can put bridging in. You can put mezzanine in. So depending on the, the size and what you're up to, you, there's kind of a whole host of things you could do. Um, so the best thing to do is go and look at that. If you look at that and sort of see what what deposits are there, and then you know you can fill out an application. They'll give you a hand to fill it all out and make sure you get um, get everything everything right. And then just to, just to elaborate on that a little bit more, Kuna, about the funding, you might find as as I do with many of my projects, I go in with, I go in with one product, and then I come out with another product because you know the, the two that I showed you today, we had to go back to brick. So the first one I showed you today is a case study that was bridging. So we went okay. in on a bridging product because it didn't really matter that it was derelict and run down and vacant. It didn't really matter. So, and then we came out from that onto a product, onto a term product. Um, and then the second one, I bought cash, but then after I got planning, I swapped it out for SAS pension. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. so, okay. So, I know what you've done. Yeah. Uh, so a SAS, pen, a SAS pension uh, uh, fund came in and, and did the lending on that. It's right. a bit like doing it independently through someone who you know who's got a SAS pension. And then that got swapped out to a term product with um, uh, one of the main lenders. That's fantastic. That was really insightful. Guys, thank you so, so much. Brilliant. Well, love to speak to you. Um, I think Anastasia did unmute herself. Let's just see if Anastasia can unmute herself now. Um, I'll give you a moment, Anastasia, just to see if you can unmute yourself. In the meantime, we'll see if um, we can get Amal to unmute himself. Hi, Amal. Hello. Good afternoon. Hi, Amal. Fantastic conference. Really interesting to hear your perspective, Stuart. And um, I actually was a completely coincidentally, somebody dropped your name in a meeting last week. And I was okay. laughing to myself, what a coincidence that I'm actually going to be in a Zoom conference with you. Um, you I'm, I'm a planter surveyor and uh, RICS registered valuer and um, have been for the past few years doing quite a lot of HMO valuations. And 
tra traditionally, I, I undertake commercial valuation. So uh, undertaking HMO valuation for, for a number of clients who are in the same uh, sector of the industry as you are was, has been quite interesting. And uh, a couple of questions I had, which I don't really get to discuss with my clients is, in the current climate, do you foresee an increase in HMO demand, as I'm seeing as, as a valuer? Um, but also 20 years ago, when I first started in this industry, I had one experience of HMOs. And I've been saying this for a while now, that the standard of HMOs has evolved in the last 15, 20 years to the wonderful sort of examples that you gave of the standards that HMOs are now being presented. And that's been kind of a, a, something that I've noticed widely in, in the region that I cover. And um, where, where do you see the HMO sort of uh, 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 property market moving? Has it peaked or has it got a long way to go? Conscious of the fact that as a small island nation, we are increasing our population potentially with what's going on in the, in the background politically, there's likely to be more increase in our population from the, the accommodation of the people coming in. And as a consequence, do you see the demand for HMOs, which are far more footed when it comes to being rented by key worker students, it doesn't result in the challenges that traditional one unit family houses used to offer. If a, a student or two had to share a house, if one fell out with the other, they couldn't meet the landlord's rent. HMOs don't obviously have that risk to landlord as well as to the tenant. So my question really is, where do you see the HMO market moving to in the next few years? Well, I think the um, we've always seen strong demand because, you know, it's that, like any market, it's product and customer. And traditionally, la landlords have not treated the, the HMO market as, as ha customers and products. And that's evolved a lot, as you've seen the, the quality and the standards gone up. But interestingly, although you've seen that quality and standard go up, in most locations, over 90% of the stock is pretty poor. Mm. So although we see the stuff that hits social media and we see the stuff that hits the magazines and we see the big visual stuff and the photos that I show, shared today, most of your competition will be pretty low quality and most landlords will not want to invest. Most mm. landlords don't care about their tenants at all and they certainly don't want to in, improve it unless they hit with occupancy issues and then they need to. So there's a massive opportunity. The actual, should we call it competition that you have in any particular town, city or area 90% of it is going to be pretty pretty average and below average anyway. So we're heading in the right direction, but we're certainly nowhere near, should we say, the quality levels of where they could go and what, where they, we hope they do go. Demand as well is, is something that, that, you know, the affordability of the one-bed flats, the studios and everything else, we're always pitching our affordability so that, you know, that, that you're getting a lot more disposable, you're getting more value for money, you're getting the social aspect and you're getting the value for money. So that there's always a very, diff very noticeable headroom in the disposable income that you save between, uh, uh, say, a one-bed flat and living in an HMO. So we're kind of servicing a need. So I would, I think that co-living HMOs, I think is just an important part of, of the evolution that we saw in bedsits. You know, bedsits was a popular thing. Now no one really wants to live in bedsits. And, you know, HMOs kind of went out of favour because, frankly, not much effort was put into the product or the experience. And now we're seeing co the co-living HMO kind of uh, a product if you like suddenly being more attractive to not just young people in their 20s 30s but up into people into their 40s and early 50s so we're seeing a wide spectrum of people interested in the community spaces plus also the um the uh the, the kind of like the whole experience the whole brand experience of living in these spaces and facilities fabulous Thank you so much. Oh, <laughs> fabulous um so next question is from I'm sort of conscious of time, but we'll just see if we have one more, if that's okay. Um, Clive, I'm just going to ask you to unmute yourself, if that works. I know you've popped a... Hi, Hi Clive. I'm well, just while we're waiting for Clive to come on, um, I noticed there was a question from Nicola about which specialist would you recommend for the D-list council tax? Uh, Nicola, if you take up um, uh, Paul's offer, when you mentioned about the, the call, he'll give you the contact details. As long as you're registered on there, I can pass that detail over to you. I haven't got it on me right now, but I can dig it out for you. Fabulous. Hi, Clive. Hello, hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Stuart, for this great information. Appreciate it. Um, my question is: I was on a I was on a meeting with you a few days ago, Stuart, and you talked about um, <clears throat> three areas having three areas to invest in yeah. for both of you. Yeah. Um, talking, you spoke a lot about planning. The, the 
the planner who is, I guess, part of your, who, who, who I would like to be part of my power team yeah. to speak, would they cover all three areas or would I need a, a different planner for each area? Well, I'm going to assume that the areas are geographic. Do you remember when we looked at that map and Paul pulled up this, do you remember he pulled up the data and we were looking, I think it was High Wycombe and yes. then there was the, no, there was Henle Hampstead, yes. High Wycombe, and there was a few different ones. Well, generally speaking, you know, we probably looked at about, there were several towns. If you just zoomed out within a two hour radius, there were several towns. Yes. Generally speaking, you should be able to get a plan that could probably accommodate most of the stuff within your geographic circle, assuming that they're part of, these towns are pocketed near each other. Okay, so okay, so that's um, yeah. That that your got your area would be your area that you're invested in would be that particular area that unless unless be, you've got three different areas that are completely different. You know, you might have one that's further up north and another one over to the yeah. you know different area of capital appreciation. I'm assuming, like what Shet, Paul shared earlier on, that your your target area was kind of geographically near okay. each other. It's just different towns. Thank you. I I get that. Thank you. And Paul. Um, did you say on your on your site on Nimbus you have a, a thing called uh, a brick flow? Um, and just explain what brick flow does. No, sorry. Yeah, sure. So on the, is on, planning expert. Is that what so, you said? Um, planning export. Yeah. So um, so brick flow on the information panel. There's a there's a button that says search um, search loans basically. So you can. You can look for development finance through um, there's a button next to sort of on the information panel next to where it talks about brick flow. Um, you can click that and it'll bring up a, a sort of little form. You fill out some details in it, talk about the scheme you're looking at, um, and it'll then it'll then scan through and, and, and see what development finance would be available, what sort of levels they're like to be at. You can see kind of eligibility criteria and this sort of stuff, and you can actually apply for the loan through um, through brick flow, which is kind of very useful, very quick, and it kind of talks through a number of questions and you kind of load in appraisals and this kind of stuff and it'll go off and, and find the right um, the right lender for you. There are people behind the scenes of that that if you need help, they'll pick up the phone and speak to you and, and take you through all of it as well. So um, so Brickflow does that. The the second bit was the planning export. Um, so within Nimbus, there's a, a tool that you can use where it'll go off and it'll find, in our case, HMO planning applications and it will link it through then to where they got consent, where they got refused, where they got withdrawn, all that kind of stuff. It'll then also link through to the owner's details so you can see who's investing in this sort of stuff, what they're paying, so you can build some comps from that as well, in, in addition to what I've shown you um, today. And on top of that, then it will show you who the applicant and who their agent was to go and submit that planning application. So you can very quickly see who are the, who are the planners that are, that are active across a council that are, as in planning consultants, are actually across council getting consents for HMOs, and therefore who are the ones that really understand the HMO product, if you like, um, and that then understand kind of what the council's approach to those HMO applications are, and can kind of take you through that neatly in effect. So, so the planning export will take you through all of that. Cool. And also, just before we wrap up, a couple of quick, quick five things I just want to cover. So, Karen Chen asked about the mixed use site I, I shared earlier on. Was it valued on the HMO? Was it valued on the mixed mixed commercial it was valued um uh, karen on the on, on an aggregate of the entire gross income for the building so they worked out the gross income for the building this is why it's so important to get your mix of the high yielding in there got the gross income of the building up and then we worked off a yield multiplier so it worked off the total um have then asked about whether that skylights are acceptable in class ma uh well with the criteria now being more stringent on windows uh you i think you might be a I don't know you, Paul, with your thoughts on that, but my, I think you'd be a bit hard pushed to just have a bedroom with a skylight and not and not a window, because that was one of the things they tightened down with the class MA from part M. Yeah, so I don't, I don't think you I get some advice on that. I mean, we've done HMOs with skylights um, without windows under full planning applications um, where we are. So okay. maybe doesn't yeah. make a great a great room, Frank. It doesn't make a great um, a great product. Not ideal, no. Um, and then we built the, it, we let it, we sold it, it was fine. Yeah. But whether it was the best room we've ever built, I don't know. Okay, two final questions. Um, um, how do you, do you get professional cleaners? Yes, in coding HMOs, every two weeks, cleaners do all of the social spaces and any shared bathrooms. And then finally, uh, council tax is it and, and services, is it included in the rent? Yes, it is. 
uh, but we do have a lot of energy efficiency in there so that we make use of uh, people not leaving the you know uh, gas electric on and everything else fabulous thank you Stuart so I suppose really kind of all that's left for me to do is to firstly thank you Stuart for your um for your uh, presentation today being very much appreciated very interesting exciting stuff lots of opportunity thank you so much for joining us no, no, absolute pleasure to join you. Yeah, if anyone has any questions or they want to get in contact with me, um, obviously, if you um, uh, contact Nimbus, they'll they'll pass over the details. Absolutely. And then finally, just a thank you to you, you all for watching. Um, hopefully you've enjoyed today. Hope it's been useful. I've been Paul Davis. We've been Nimbus Maps. We'll look forward to seeing you again soon. All the best. Bye for now. <laughs>